Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to this quickie talk about Bean Validation 2.0. I hope you enjoyed the conference so far. I know it's a lot of interesting talks going on, so I appreciate to see that many of you here during the lunch break, actually. Um, my name is Gunnar Morling, so if you had checked the program a long time ago, it said Emmanuel Bernard would be here, but unfortunately, he could not come, so I'm taking his place. I hope that's okay for you folks. <laughs> Let me quickly tell you a bit about me. I work as a software engineer as, at Red Hat, and the project I'm focused on mostly these days is called Debezium, which is a change data capturing platform. And if you would like to learn more about that one, I did a talk about it yesterday, and it should be up on YouTube on the DevOps channel so you can find out about Debezium and what it is about. I'm the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0, which is the stuff I'm going to talk about now. And finally, I'm doing some other projects on the site, um, which I also uh, did some quickie talks about here at DevOps. Okay, Bean Validation 2.0. So it's going to be a lot, unfortunately, but I hope um, it gets across. All right, so what is it about? It's about supporting Java 8 and taking advantage of Java 8 for the purposes of validation. So we created the new JSR 380, and if you wonder why it is a new major version uh, 2.0, this really is the reason that we found out we cannot take advantage of Java 8 in a way which then would you allow to use this new version with earlier Java versions. So we found out, okay, we have to make this Java 8 only, and that's why it's been validation 2.0. And I would like to present some of the new features in form of use cases which you will typically encounter in the context of validation, and we will see how we benefit from being validation 2 and Java 8. And the first one is validation of passwords. And more specifically, you would like to make sure that depending on the role which a user has in your application, different lengths should be enforced for their password. So a regular user should have a password of length 8, whereas an administrator should have a password of length, length 12. And the way you do this in Bean Validation is you specify a constraint at size in this, con in this case multiple times and assign it then to different validation groups. And before Java 8, you had to specify this list annotation explicitly, whereas now we can just write those constraints, those annotations right after each other multiple times which is possible by means of the new repeatable annotation feature in Java 8. So that's not something super exciting, but it's just a very nice um, readability enhancement, I would say. It makes it a bit more pleasant. Next use case would be validating collections. And uh, here the example is I have a list of names, a list of strings, and I would like to make sure that this list does not contain any empty strings. So each, each string should be a non-empty string. And I could think about such a not empty annotation, and in, indeed there is such a constraint now in bean validation too, but if I specify it here on the list, it will apply to this list. So this means the list itself, it should contain at least one element. Um, it doesn't say anything about the strings within this list. Whereas now if I put this constraint to the um, string type argument, the semantics change, and this is possible by those new type annotations in Java 8, which essentially allow me to put constraints in many more places and use annotations in many more places. And one example is type arguments of generic types. So I put this constraint here now, and now it's getting clear this applies to the elements of the list, the strings within the list, not the list itself. I could have multiple constraints. So here I'm saying each contained name should be non-empty and it should satisfy this regular expression. And I also could combine it, of course, with the not empty constraint on the list itself. So this means the list should contain at least one element, and each string should be a non-empty string. We also benefit from the type annotations for the purposes of what we call cascaded validation. This was something which always existed in bean validation. It means you can traverse into an object graph and validate all the constraints on your entire object graph by means of this at valid annotation. So this is how you would have done it before uh, in bean validation 1, and this is how you can do it in bean validation 2. So you can put the at valid annotation now to this type argument again. And the semantics of this are pretty much the same as before. I would just say it's getting a bit more apparent that this applies to the constraints which are defined on the address type, but pretty much it means the same as before. It's getting more interesting if you think about maps. So bean validation always had support for maps and the validation of maps, but only for the validation of the values within a map, whereas now I also can enforce the cascaded validation of the keys of a map. So here I'm saying, if this map gets validated, please also validate all the constraints which are on the comment key objects in this map. 
Again, I can combine it with validation on the, on the values or even nested collections. So here I'm saying, please, um, if addresses by type, if this bean which contains this property gets validated, validate all the constraints on the address types, which are the keys here, and then for all the lists of addresses, for all the addresses within those lists, please validate their constraints. Of course, you would not do this um, in a much deeper level. Probably you would introduce some sort of intermediary type, but bean validation lets you deal with those cascaded collections. There's support for other types. So Java 8 has this new optional type, which you would use as a return type for a method which might return a value or not. So here uh, I have this get email method, which re may return a string. And if it, the value is present, it should be a valid email address. So I can uh, express this by putting this new at email constraint to the type argument. And we also have support for all those Java FX property types. So let me just quickly go to the Eclipse IDE. Um, and in JavaFX, what you do is you don't work with the normal property types such as int or long or string and so on, but instead they have their own hierarchy of property types. So you have something like string property or property of uh, something, list property, and so on. And now we can put all the bean validation constraints also to those JavaFX property types. <clears throat> And just to show, so this is just a simple example with a, a simple entity, a simple model, and some properties. But let me run it for you so you see this at least in action. Um, so this just is a simple dialogue. And I, what, um, uh, by the way, a member of the Beam Validation Expert Group has created this demo. And validation is kicking in now as I type here. And the error message is bound to this, to this label here. And for instance, this one, it must be value greater than 50, so if I move the slider beyond 50, the error marker will go away. So that's quite nicely and quite easy for me to put validation now to um, JavaFX models. All right, that's that. And of course, we cannot know, uh, um, as spec people, we cannot know about all potential collection types out there, right? So you could think about libraries such as Google Guava, which define many very useful collection types. So they have something like a multi-map or like a graph type, like a ta table type. And of course, it would be very nice to be able to use constraints on those collection types. So for instance, here we have this table type from Guava, which is like a two-dimensional spreadsheet which associates a value with a key and a row. And now I would like to say, OK, the value the revenue value per year in category, it should be a positive number. So there's this new positive constraint, and I would like to apply this to the values in this, um, in this table. And as I said, we cannot know about this, but then we have to find an extension point, an SPI for this, and this allows you as users, or also library authors, as the Google folks, to plug in custom what we call value extractors. And such a value extractor then is in charge of getting the value from the table here and feed it to the Bean Validation Engine. Another use case for this extension point is other languages. So if you think about languages such as Ceylon or Scala, which have their own collection libraries, which are independent from the Java collection libraries, again, it would be very nice to put constraints to those collection types. And again, implementing this SPI would allow to do this. Just to give an example how such a value extractor would look like, all you have to do is you need to implement this value extractor interface. It has a single method um, which receives the container to extract the values from, and it receives a callback which you need to call to emit all the values from this um, container. So here we are just iterating over all the cells which are on a table, and we call this keyed value method to make sure that the, the error message or the constraint violation which would which result in this constraint being violated, it, that it has a key, um, a reference to the key of this table cell. <clears throat> okay, um, next use case would be in your ordering order management application, you would like to make sure that the delivery date is in the future. And if you have been working with bean validation before, you will know that there are the at past and the at future constraint. And they are still there, of course, but now they are all su also supported for all those new date and time APIs, which have been added in Java 8. So there's JSR 3.10, which defines many very useful types, such as local date time, zoned date time, and so on. And those constraints are now supported for all these types. And we also added uh, two new constraints, future or present and past or present. And they are very useful if this is about validating some type which does not represent a particular instant on the timeline, but rather a range, so like an entire day or an entire month, an entire year. And this future or present here would express, OK, this delivery date, it should be satisfied, it should be valid if the date is either 
um, today or in the, uh, either now or in the future as of today. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, we have added some new constraints. You have seen some of them already, so there's not empty, not blank for strings. We have add email, which I think was the one which has been requested most of the times. There is um, positive, positive or zero, negative, negative or zero, which deal with a number, numeric types, and there are those two, past or present and future or present. And in case you, or you might wonder, how did we decide which constraints to add? And we tried to be very inclusive with the community here. So what we did is one pr a member of the expert group went to GitHub and analyzed essentially all the Java projects on GitHub and searched them for custom constraints. So what are custom constraints which are not defined by the Beam validation spec, which are used in projects out there? And apparently, obviously, they would be good candidates to add. And then we had some sort of candidate set, and we did a uh, survey on beanvalidation.org, our website, and um, arrived that way at those constraints which we added. Just one thing to mention about email. So this is this annotation type is defined in the spec, but um, if you, or we what we found is it's nearly impossible to give a valid definition of an email which would be generally applicable. So for different people, a valid email address could be something very different. So we decided, okay, we add the annotation type so you can use it, but then we would leave it to actual implementations such as hybrid well data, the reference implementation, to implement this and the particular um, semantics of this one. <clears throat> to try it out yourself, um, the spec is finalized. It's part of um, Java E8, which has been released a couple of weeks ago. So you could, for instance, use the Java E, um, Java E8 reference implementation, class Fish 5, and this will be part of this already. Um, the reference implementation is Hibernate Well Data 6. And um, so we also did the release of this, of course, the final release. And since then, we actually put out multiple um, micro releases, which for once contain many good bug fixes. but Almost more importantly, we spent quite a good amount of time on optimizing the performance. So really the good thing is, Bean Validation 2 and the reference implementation is oftentimes much faster than Bean Validation 1 and the old reference implementation. Um, if you happen to use Wildfly, uh, it's not part of Wildfly 11 yet, but what we do is we provide a patch file for you, which makes it very easy to get Hibernate Validator, Bean Validation, the new version, and patch an existing Wildfly instance with that, so it would then be using Bean Validation 2.0. If you are more like a Spring kind of person, Spring 5 also supports Bean Validation 2.0, so it's something you can work with. And one thing which is very close to my heart is um, everything is open source here. So the spec is open source, it's written in ASCII doc, the API is open source, the TCK, the test kit is open source, and you might have followed the news around um, EE4J and all the open sourcing of Java EE, so essentially this is happening now for all the specs, for all the Java EE specs, but I'm really happy to say that Bean Validation has been fully open source from day one. So if you've got something you think should be added to the spec, um, well, you can essentially come to us and contribute and um, have first a discussion and finally send a pull request. <coughs> with that, I'm done. Uh, Beanvalidation.org, that's the central hub with all the information about bean validation. All the source code of the API and the reference implementation, everything else is on GitHub. And yeah, for instance, you could come and explore a new feature in the reference implementation first, and then we could think about making this a new official feature in a potential future version. With that, I am done, and there would be one minute, 30 seconds left for questions, <laughs> if there are any. Any questions? Okay, you seem all overwhelmed. I know it was a lot. <laughs> okay, otherwise, I would say enjoy the rest of the conference, and if you got something, just come to me, and we can have a chat here. Thank you. <clears throat>